It was a, a huge concern uh, of mine, and I'm sure, as Deputy DC has said, the other members of the committee, uh, that we're now entering into those two inquiries without being able to define within a reasonable way. I know there's risk in it, within a reasonable way, just exactly the extent and the cost uh, involved. And it, it's, it, it, it doesn't sit well with me. I, I, you know, what you say in your opening statement is fine, but I caution against the decision to have what would seem to be an open check in both cases, uh, because that's what we're looking at here. And I would say to those that are making policy to think twice about what they're doing and the benefits of the spend of that kind of taxpayer's money uh, to achieve what, I would certainly want to see it set out. And it's a pity in terms of the OECD report when we reflect on that, that the system is not in place in this House to examine in a very detailed way the proposal and the costs to determine if what's going to come out of this report is worth that kind of money. And if that was a business, that's the question that would dominate. And it is based on that, the cost benefit and the analysis and the information in terms of what the public uh, should know. That does not seem to be considered in this case. So really what I'm asking here is, who is going to cry stop? should all of this be just a step too far. And as Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, I'm you know, cautioning your department and the policy makers in relation to this, because it would seem that we're going down the same old road that we travelled before without learning anything. Which brings me to the OCD report, and just a comment on it. I was there for the, I participated in that report, and I was there for the launch of it. And uh, while I welcome the report, it's the basis, the basis of, of um, I suppose, debate and conversation uh, for the various committees. It is extremely disappointing that, like the budget being front-loaded to spend the money, it talks about the, the budgetary process to examine the amounts of money to be spent, but there is no emphasis thereafter within the report on skinning up the, uh, or, or, sorry, empowering the Comptroller and Auditor General uh, to have a much greater role in relation to the examination of the spend of taxpayers' money to the point where it is being spent, unlike some other jurisdictions. And it excludes any commentary in relation to an amalgamation of the local government audit team and the CNAG's office and empowering this committee to do the job that the public believes it is doing. Uh, because earlier on, before you came in, uh, Deputy Costello and others were raising the question of the wards of court and the replies from the department and where recommendations go and so on and the delay in coming back to us. And, and, and uh, Until such time as sanctions are introduced as part of the structure of this committee, it will continue to be you know, effective but not effective enough and give an oversight but not enough oversight and being, if you like, uh, separated from the two and a half to four billion, depending on what good times or bad times you're in, in terms of local government. Um, and lastly, uh, on, on, on your opening statement, could I ask you in relation to um, the central bank and the payment of retention money, uh, which was reported this morning? Um, What's, if any, have you, what role do you have in relation to any of that? Uh, so just a few, a few comments, uh, Chair. In relation to the uh, CNAG and local government and the relation with CNAG and the, the local government auditor, I think in the past I've expressed my views that our department would have a very open mind about that, about whether we should amalgamate uh, both. I think I've said this, I've said this before, uh, and I think you and I are, are, are broad agreement here, uh, and certainly our department uh, will be supportive of that and we have, in, we have in the past. We do know that the, the CNAG and this process has uh, a very strong impact in terms of value for money and ensuring that uh, departments account for money uh, and that they're called to account for this committee, and that's very powerful. And uh, if, if we believe that uh, could have an impact in terms of local government spend, well, then uh, that's an issue. Certainly, we wouldn't, we wouldn't object to that. And I, I, in the past, I've supported, uh, and my view, hasn't, my view hasn't changed on that. 
In terms of some of the issues you mentioned about responding to recommendations of reports, you remember when our department was established in 2011, one of the issues you came to me about, Chair, was that it took an awful long time for, the, for, for, the min, for us to respond to the recommendations and minutes of, of, of reports. Mm. And we, we have put great effort into ensuring that we respond promptly. I think we now respond within, within 11, 12 weeks, I think, Dermot. Uh, and we put pressure on departments to respond. So we've really put in, I think, I think the Cotona Gel might be conferring this, but we've put a lot of effort in this, and I think it's improved in terms of the timeliness of the response. The Cords of Ward, Cords of Ward uh, report, I think, arrived in our department last week. Uh, I had a chance to look at it last night, uh, and we will review it, and as much as it, it relates to our work, uh, we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back to you on that. But we only literally received it last week, so we haven't had a chance to look at it in detail. Uh, and we'll, we will we will come back and we will uh, give you a view. We've had a chance to had a chance to, to consider it. And the central bank report this morning. The central bank report. So, uh, so uh, we're aware of, of uh, we've become aware of, of these uh, of these payments. Uh, we are we are surprised uh, about the payments. Uh, we just we just heard about them. Uh, the uh, key issue, I think, for the central bank, they have to satisfy themselves that they're uh, compliant with the law and they're compliant with the provisions of the relevant acts. Uh, so that's the first issue for them that they have to they have to satisfy themselves that they're compliant with the with the acts. Uh, do you, we do you think they are in terms of retention? Uh, I, I don't if know. Payment, payment uh, I, I don't know. I think we'd have to. We haven't had a chance to review it. It only came to light this week. Uh, but does your your department has a role in that, hasn't it? No, no. we don't. Central Bank uh, is, is is separate in terms of discharge of its function in relation to pay. Uh, we certainly, since we're the uh, the originators of the legislation, the legislation applies to Central Bank. We're certainly happy to to support them in their assessment. But I think the key issue is. Uh, uh, are they consistent with the, the legislation that, that, that governs the pay ranges uh, uh, for the bank? And that's something that we will explore. We'll explore with them. Yeah, one, one is not the start of the banking structures in Ireland, giving the two fingers to the government again, which it did previously. Um, and I think that uh, maybe an early indication from uh, government departments that that kind of uh, retention payment, uh, or indeed uh, the other areas that they got into, will not be tolerated again. Uh, otherwise, they go back into the same culture uh, that we've all just come out of, uh, and they're inclined to do that. And they certainly have shown, in my opinion, very little respect for business people, the ordinary citizen, mortgage holders, and indeed government in the past. And I think that we should, if we have manners at all put on them, we should ensure that they stay on them. Just in, in relation um, to procurement, uh, Mr. Watt, um, I don't expect you to police every you know, contract or arrangement that's entered into. Uh, but for the last uh, number of years, and particularly the last, uh, say, two years, um, we have had to uh, examine uh, accounts of various departments of agencies. And in most of the accounts, we would have issues where procurement was not entered into properly, as agreed um, with your uh, department. For example, in 2014, uh, on the Garda vote, there was 51 contracts, the total value of 6.7 uh, million. On the prison side of it, there was 11 contracts with a value of 2.8 million. The court services, nearly three quarters of a million. Um, agriculture, 14 contracts with a total value of 1.5 million. Social protection, 10 contracts, a total of 1 million and 299 cases in terms of the HSE, valued at 56.5 million. Now, they, they then turned to us in terms of their explanation, and they were good to give explanations such as, uh, you know, it did, it generally, this is what's happening of late. We didn't have specialist procurement staff. Mm. Um, there was an extension or a rollover of the contract. Mm -hmm. They had to require or acquire the goods from, you know, a, a special agent, or they had to um, single supplier only, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. They had to yeah. deal with an urgent matter and so on. It's similar to the explanation in one of the set of accounts that you gave this morning, which had, I think, 400 and something thousand uh, of procurement without uh, the appropriate um, process being put in place, and that that sends out uh, a very negative, I think, signal. Uh, about the procurement 
um, processes. Now, in the educational sector, for example, um, UCD applies a threshold of 60,000 for opening for open tendering contract of contracts, rather than the 25,000 that they should. They've just taken the view that, well, we're going to apply 25,000. Uh, sorry, 60,000, 65, uh, not, not 25. Now, I, all of us here at, at this public accounts have questioned this over the last while. And this morning, in terms of the accounts from Board and Lagan, they continue to have issues um, around uh, procurement. So it is an issue yeah. within the government departments and agencies that they continue to operate outside of the guidelines. And not alone that, but in a lot of cases that we have examined, they receive very poor value for money. Yeah. Can, can I ask, Chair, of, of, of all, for 2014, what was the value of all those of contracts you mentioned? What's the total? Sure, that's... Uh, because the CDAG did a report last year, which covered a period, and suggested that there was around 150 million of spend, which wasn't well, subject. Well, within the government department which alone, wasn't, was 77 million. 77. So, so, so it wasn't. So it wasn't subject to a competitive process. Now, now that's government there, departments. Yeah, there, agencies so, then. But, I, but just to hear me for a second. But there are valid reasons why you wouldn't have a competitive process. There are valid reasons which we accept. It shouldn't be the norm, and it's not the norm. But there are reasons for an extension of a contract. Reasons, reasons of urgency, or if the only supplier of the of the service only one supplier of the service. So there are reasons why you wouldn't have a competitive process. And what we stress to the departments is that uh, in the vast majority of cases, you should go through a competitive tender process based on the rules that Paul has seen, have set out. And based on the, the EU guidelines, they're, they're not our rules necessarily, they're EU guidelines where it's very clear that needs to be competitive. But, but the issue for us is of, of the amount, and the CDAG's last report on this, I think there was only 30, 40 million of spend without a competitive process where there wasn't a good reason for the absence of a competitive process. Now, that's the subset where the problem is, which is not acceptable. It's that, it's that amount, which is not acceptable. And I absolutely agree with you. It's not acceptable and needs to be addressed. But can I just make a, a, a point? I know you, you hate when I say this, but spend is 10 billion. Like 30 million, 40 million of non-compliance with a process out of a spend of 10 billion is that, a, is, that an, is that an okay outcome? Like, are, is that a disastrous outcome for us? Like, I would contend that we need to, we need to do better, and that shouldn't happen, but in the overall scheme of things, that that's a pretty effective level of compliance, because it suggests to me that 99.99%, whatever, of the spend is actually compliant. Well, you see... Is that the case, though? No, like, no, is that, is that no, the case? Like, no, is it material? Let, let, let the overall scheme of things. Let me explain this, material. Mr. Watson, the overall scheme of things. Yeah. We often hear the figure quoted here of 8 billion, 9 billion. Now, you said 10 billion in oh, terms of, of the, the, the spend on, on, on public procurement within the service. And I take absolutely your, the remark in your opening statement where you say, in the general scheme of things of yeah. 54 billion, there will be um, mistakes. Yeah. Yes, of course there will. What I'm referring to here is the number of agencies and government departments that continue to operate without really great effort outside of the rules of procurement. And as long as you have these two, four, yeah. six, eight, ten, uh, uh, as long uh, as you have these, uh, now let me finish, yeah. as long as you have these ten reasons as stated here, almost two thirds of them are in, in the bracket of, well, and the dog ate my homework. So, that, so that's where well, they fall into. No, no, it isn't. Oh, no, they do. No, no sorry, and, Chair. No, no sorry, no, let me finish. Well, uh, let me finish, and I will allow you then okay. to answer. Yeah. I have the floor, and I will ask the question. Okay. So, yes, before you left here, yes yeah. the performance <laughs> in terms of this is good. Does, does, you know, and, and, but it's not acceptable. It could be a hell of a lot better. And I say that in the context of what's being offered as an excuse for not procuring stuff properly. And, and, and that is a fact. And, you know, Deputy DC raised the issue of the Aran Island issue and the procurement there. And there are examples of procurement that just fall way short of the mark. And what I'm asking you is, if when that happens, and it's clear that there is an issue here, 
What power do you have to get them, the departments and the agencies, to work in accordance with the general scheme of things? So, uh, thank you, Chair. So, like, I, I, I note that you say the performance is good or acceptable. I think it's better than good, based on the data that well, I've you seen. You would say that. Now, local government is um, they're striking their budgets all over the country. Yeah. And one of the issues they're faced with is the utilities and the reduction in their valuations, I think it was. And as a result of that, there's a 22 million euro, I think, shortfall all over the taking all of the local authorities into account relative to their budget. So, for example, in my own county of Kilkenny, there's 200,000 euro, which will not be collected from the real big companies like the, 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 the utilities. The, the telecos and the utilities. So that 200,000 is going to be shaved off the services, the figures for services to people in County Kilkenny. Yeah. Now the same applies to Waterford where they have to shave off I think 1 million uh, euros relative to their local authority budget. 1.3 1.3 million. And from those figures to 22 million nationally. So, because of that shortfall, and because of the fact that it has to do with rates, is there not an argument for? Um, I think your department is responsible for the valuations office. Is that right? They're independent in their functions. Yeah, but, but they, they, are, they report to they report to our department. Yes. But the fallout of their independent function is that this this change has taken place. Yeah. Is it not within? The, um, I suppose the work of the department looking at this, that they would reallocate some of the unspent monies to local authorities to assist them because of this once-off issue that they're all facing. So there's a, glo a global revaluation takes place. Yeah. On this occasion, the, the, the rateable value has come down, so there's a loss of income up to 22 million deputy, as you, as you say. It would be worth exploring what would have happened if the valuation had gone the other way. Where the actual they'd increase the receipts to local government, would local government have then sent the back that money and reduced the allocation from the centre? Just posing it as a question because yeah. this can go both ways. Because we do these revaluations, it can go the other way. And we've had revaluations in the past where the income is the same. So anyway, so I would I'd be interested if I'd be asked this question if, if it went the other way. Uh, so there's a shortfall. So so the options then are for local authorities to reduce their services, or for them to increase their property tax or increase their rates and everybody else or to come to government looking for money. They're the, the three options. So I guess I, I think I know which option they're going to go for. OK, well, uh, to, answer, to answer the question, had it gone the other way, they probably wouldn't have come back to you. No, they wouldn't have. No. But that is not the issue. The reality is it did go the other way. It did go the other way. And it's now $22 million, So Upwards of $22 million, yeah. Yeah, upwards of yeah. $22 million. At so, a spending of $5 billion. Yeah, so it's upwards of $22 billion, yeah. million, and yeah. then local authorities now have to cut their services, on what is, as is the case in County Kilkenny and raise the rates by 5% to compensate for the relief that some of the biggest companies in the country have received. That's right. And I'm making the point that that would seem to be out of kilter with a remark in your statement where the, those that are least well off and marginalised and so on will be supported. They're now going to be targeted uh, by local authorities. It's a fact. It's there in their estimates. Uh, and the small businesses in, in, in the counties are being asked to pay an extra 5%. And I'm just making the point, I'm asking to go into policy area, that if there is this kind of money going back to the Exchequer, and maybe from other departments as well, that consideration should be given to rebalancing uh, that figure at local authority level. I'm only making the point. This is I think it's a valid point. No, I think, look, this is a policy. You, you mentioned in your report about the Ombudsman the freedom of information and all of the, the different changes there. Yeah. Uh, and again, it just refers to the work of committees in this House. Uh, there was a single taxpayer where the Ombudsman's office uh, recommended full payment of on a particular issue. And I think half payment was made by revenue. Yep. And ever since then, committees of this House, uh, mainly finance, uh, have made recommendations that this single taxpayer, well, I'm not advocating for him, it's the issue I'm concerned about, should be paid as per the Ombudsman's 
uh, yeah, report recommendations. recommendations yeah. And having examined it by various committees now of the House, uh, sorry, various committees of finance in different terms have examined this and have made the same recommendation. And to this day, that pay, uh, half payment, has, other half payment rather, has not been made. Yep. So not everyone is afraid of the committees of this House. That's true. Um, that's an example of someone deliberately ignoring the hearings of a committee that went on and signed off by a number of different chairmen of that committee. So it's not, it, it's every party did this. Um, and I just feel that that particular payment, um, it should be reviewed. Um, someone should ask about it. Uh, it's an expenditure, you know, in terms of, of what's been suggested to finance. Why it's not being paid, I don't know, particularly given the independence of the Ombudsman, the independence of the various reviews that have been undertaken mm. at this House, and the fact that it was I think it was referred to the House to go on the, um, uh, to be taken as a motion or something. Uh, was, so I would just encourage you to look at it in terms of the expenditure. Um, We've dealt with, with um, you know, Borden and Nagan, and I, I again expressing concern in relation to the fact that organisations are often looked at on the basis of concern about their their, their ongoing business, um, and that has been said about Borden and Nagan. We have them in again next week, but I feel obliged as chairman of the committee to highlight it to you that there are continued, um, I suppose, concerns about that organisation. Um, and about others that have been listed by the CNAG with the same comment uh, on their reports. Uh, and lastly, I just want to go back without getting into a discussion about it, to the comments you made about um, the committees of this House, uh, you know, vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the, the secretary or the, the, those that would be applying for leadership roles. And I think really the answer to it, Mr Watt, is this. If that's what they were scared of in terms of applying for the job, or was one of the reasons, one of the things that they were scared about. Given the fact that some of them would have been in control of billions of euros of spend on behalf of the taxpayer, then I suggest you were better off without them. That's what I would say to you. Yeah. Because there's not, I, I, I fail to see how they can offer that kind of comment and how, you know, we must talk to Fiona Tierney about it actually. Um, because I know some of the biggest companies in the country whom you would regard as being, you know, hard-nosed in terms of business. There's none of them short of leadership staff. You know, when Secretary Generals come in here, it's far better that they have that type of conversation than, you know, trying to hide behind some yeah, no, or other. And the conversation has to happen. Right, the conversation has to happen, yeah, it's key. Well, otherwise, it, 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 it won't change. Yeah. And that brings us to the point of when you examine local government, they may produce reports about local government, they may produce value for money reports. They, ne they never get debated in, in, in the real public sense of, you know, by comparison to what happens here. And the public see that too. And if you ask them, well, what do you want? Do you want that type of secrecy or do you want the open public debate? And it's my view that, and I, I think it's the view yeah. of the general public, they want to see yeah. open public debate. Yeah. And the reason why there's an appetite there, you can measure that appetite by virtue of the fact that, uh, you know, everyone wants to televise now, live. And if that's the way it's going to be, well then, you have to have horses for that course. Sure. 